Hi everyone, my name is Jamil. Is it good? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> my name is Jamil. I, um, I work for Pivotal since 2014. Uh, I used to work for Pivotal Labs and I switched to the Cloud Foundry team. And uh, since I switched to Cloud Foundry team since around two years, uh, I've been working on Bosch, which we'll be talking about. And this talk is going to be split into two parts. The first one is what is Bosch? Like what do we use it for? what it tries to solve. And the second part is the juicy one, uh, a special case of using it. And maybe it will be more, uh, more applicable for everyone here. So, cool. This is my website. Whenever you see any avatar, that's me, probably somewhere around the internet. Uh, cool. And this website, actually, it's hosted on GitHub for free. If you want to host websites on GitHub, or anywhere for free, for your personal, please use GitHub. I'm cheap. <laughs> That's fine. <right>. OK. <coughs> so what is Bosch exactly? Uh, first one, it's an open source software, 100%. It's on GitHub hosted. That's its website, Bosch.io. Uh, if you want to go see the code, it's all open, the commits, who's the committer, all of that. And uh, even like the tracker, basically it's the uh, tracking system for all the features that are coming in. It's also there open source too. So you can see like what's coming in and what's going. Uh, who are the main contributors to Bosch? Uh, main contributor is Pivotal. And there's also IBM. And there's SAP in Germany. Um, SAP in Germany and IBM in Russia. Uh, we come together and then Everyone just, they will contribute something and then we're working together. Um, just at the beginning, like, what is it really used for? Um, how many here know about Cloud Foundry or have heard of it? Cool. So it's mainly <coughs> Cloud Foundry in most of those companies, actually, if not all of it, they use Bosch to deploy it. Uh, and we'll go into details like why and what they like. For example, IBM, Ble uh, IBM Bluemix, they use Bosch. Pivotal, they use Bosch. We definitely use it. SAP, they use Bosch. And all on their own IaaS's or <coughs> whatever they have. But all of them, they use the actual Bosch that we, we're writing. Uh, there's also, recently, there is a partner partnership between Google and Pivotal to use Bosch to deploy Kubernetes. And we'll talk about it too in details. <coughs> I just posted it, so there's 15,000 commits and counting uh, on this website, <coughs> on GitHub. And let's start. Imagine just the basic example. I have set of databases, a cluster of databases, a cluster of web servers, and I want to deploy it on a special I on any IaaS, and I want to recreate it anytime I want I want to, let's say, if there's a kernel CVE comes in, I want to just click one command, and it will recreate the VMs with the new kernel, without downtime, and with reproducibility. So whatever was there, it will be still there after I create it. This is most what actually Bosch tries to address. I have a certain infrastructure with code running. I want to easily recreate it and deploy it without too much headaches. Day two headaches, not day one. But we're working on it. <coughs> so one thing actually, <coughs> maybe it will sound uh, a bit shiny statement. Whenever you're using Bosch, think about not VMs. Let's say I want to have 10 VMs of this and three VMs of that and whatever. Think about what the service that you want to try to run. Let's say I want to have uh, an HTTP server and I want to have, let's say, an Apache Tomcat server running, and any service that you have. I want a database. Think, think about it in a service rather than VMs, because as we go deeper into it, the VMs don't really mean too many things. You will see like how many VMs you have, but you don't care too much about it. So this is the, personally, I like it too much about Bosch. Think about it in services. You'll believe me later, if you don't. So, For now, let's say we just pick, take the basic example. 
I want to have a database, and then I want to have a web server. I want to deploy it on a special IaaS, any IaaS, and make it happen. I start from scratch. What do I really want? Let's say just, if you think, let's say, let's think, what do we really want? We want our source code, probably, to run it. We want like scripts to how to run my source code, whatever source code it is. Plus, I want like an OS image, like to build the VM from, for example. And some, can anybody think of something maybe? Something else? Let's say those are the basic ones. I want my source code and then I want an OS image. Fine. Let's split it up into Bosch actually, imagine it's a black box that you need to feed it two things. You need to feed it your source code first and you need to feed it your stem cell. Let's talk about the source code. In Bosch terminology, that black box, you'll give it a tarball. That tarball, it will contain, let's say, your Java app, your Ruby app, your whatever app, plus it will contain some scripts, how you run this application in a very formatted way that Bosch knows, and it will run it for you. And the concept of a release is a very nice thing that Bosch does, and I personally also like it too about it. Everything that you need to run your application. I don't need to go wget something to care something from an S3, uh, do app install, whatever, whatever, this library. Everything that you need for your application to run, it should be in that tarball. So, sorry. So imagine that you have in a data center, you have zero access to the internet, you can't ping anyone. Yep. And that tarball should include everything that you need to run. And this is a very nice thing so that reproducibility and if you want to recreate something you don't really need to worry about too many dependencies oh my internet connection is down did somebody delete that s3 bucket somewhere all that should be in that table so that table what does it contain it contains something we call packages and packages are your source code and any of their dependencies let's say if you want to run a java application you will have let's say a jar file or your java code You'll have the JDK, JRE, for example. And if you want to run anything else, you want to have that thing and its dependencies. So those what we are called packages in our release. And then the next thing in that tarball, we call jobs. Jobs are scripts, just shell scripts, that will run your packages. Java dash jar, whatever. You have a shell script, and Bosch will take it and run it. This is like a very simple, not simple actually, it's the, the basic explanation of that Bosch release, what do you feed it? Any questions till now? Go ahead. So interesting that you say in the release is source code, not, not the executable. Uh, you can have both. It depends on your actual, uh, actual application. Yeah. For example, let's say if I want to have Java, I can just put the jar file in there and I know it is going to run anywhere. Oh. Yeah. So it's either code, code or the actual Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Am I boring someone yet? OK, cool. So the concept of release, just before I continue, the concept of release is like one of the, I don't think there's too many softwares that they do that. Maybe they do. I, I have a limited knowledge of many things. But the concept of release having everything inside that tarball, stick it in that box, just give it to that black box, it's going to make it happen. I like right. it. Um, like, so Go how ahead. How is this different from, let's say, like a container, like a Docker or whatever? Mm, you mean, let's say, you package everything in your Docker? Say you have Docker. I think it depends what you're trying to solve. It depends what you're trying to solve, for example. For example, Bosch. Mm. So, you, you don't, for example, okay, how is that so different? You want me to? Go ahead. So one, one way to think about it is that a Docker container presumes you have a virtual machine to run the Docker container on. Bosch will create for you the virtual machine if you put the Docker container on. So it's actually operating at a lower level than containers do. 
It's managing the infrastructure beneath the containers. Would it also be fair to say that packages and jobs are OS independent, whereas when you build a Docker image, you've got your apps fused to the OS layer that's underneath them? But how would you make an OS independent job? Like if it's a script? Well, package is source code. Yeah. New version of the software on a different OS, you'd have to build a new Docker image with a different base layer. So there's one step actually to add to what Adib and Jonathan, there's a compilation step. So that, that tarball that you get, it will not directly be run. You need to compile it on whatever, let's say, let's say you, you want to put it on Ubuntu, let's say on Linux. You need to have a compilation step. Bosch will compile it for you, and then it's going to run it for you. Yeah. Did, did I answer a question too much? Or did Adib answer a question? Yeah, oh yeah. Or And the second thing that you give that black box, which is Bosch for now, is a stem cell, an OS image. I shouldn't have said stem cell. It's an OS image. You want to create a VM. You want to create it from an OS image. You just feed it that. And in the Bosch terminology, that OS image, we call it a stem cell because it's just a regular OS image plus few components that we inject in it so that we bootstrap the VM. And those components, the things that we injected with, there's like a special binary. We call it the agent. That's how we talk to the, that VM to tell it what to do. And plus a few hardened rules for that OS image to have it. And any questions about them? The, the, the difference between this the stem cell OS image is very minimal. Nothing, no frills. It's kind of like a no frills OS image. Uh, sorry, I didn't get it. As opposed to, like, here's my understanding, a stem cell, mm -hmm. it's the bare minimum of an OS. More or less. No, no frills, kind of. Exactly. Uh, it's a no frills OS. Exactly. Plus few binary, actually one binary that we put ourselves in our image. That's the binary. It's like a, an agent that we talk to, mm -hmm. that uh, like the Bosch will talk to, so that it will tell the director, it will tell the VM what to do, like what, what to do on it, yeah. So we have that. So you had a question? No. OK. So. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So till now, so we have that black box. It contains a, you will feed it an OS image, and then you will feed it to the tarball that contains your source code and how to run your scripts. That's cool. You have some shell, some shell scripts, and then you have some source code. Uh, how many VMs do you want? Or let's say, how many services do you want? Uh, which service you want to tell it to talk to which another uh, which other service that the third thing that you will feed that blocks and it's a yaml file if you're surprised and that yaml file it's just it will contain the skeleton of what you really want to deploy and i'll just show here a specific format of that yaml file it will be let me see This is just a, let me go here. Just some basic information. Let's say you tell it which stem cells it want to use. You want to tell it which releases. That's like the tarballs that you want to feed it. Um, you have few configuration here. You want to tell it like how many services do you want to have? How many instances of each service that you want to have? Let's say you have a database here. And this is, for example, a we call it a deployment manifest of a service we, it's like a CI, CI, CD system. It's called Conquers. It has a web component, it has a DB, and then it has some workers. Um, 
for and inside each contain inside each service you'll have multiple processes running and for example inside your web you will have what we call the jobs which we uh, which we got from the actual release to run it any questions confusing not interesting <laughs> cool it will get more interesting i promise And actually, you know what? Let's actually go and then show the actual release, like what does it contain? <laughs> we have it. Let's go to the notes. OK. This is a tarball. We open it. It has the jobs, which are the scripts that you're going to use to run it. And then it will have the packages uh, that contain your. For example, this is a JMeter Bosch release, which we're going to demo in the <coughs> later on. Uh, as you can see, let's say we have the JDK, we have the JMeter source code. And uh, let me actually make it. OK. So we have that, <coughs> we have that tarball. It contains your jobs. And <coughs> let's say this is a, uh, let's open one of those jobs. And it will contain some ARB templates that they will be potentially shell script. They will be rendered to shell scripts. Um, and inside the packages, you, for example, you have OpenJDK. It's nothing but just the JDK package, just the tarball. And if we go to the JMeter, just the same thing. So everything that you need to run your software, it's going to run there. You should, it should be there. Uh, it depends. You can have, let's say, for example, in you have we have two kinds of stem cells. We have Linux, and we have uh, Windows stem cells. Let's say if it's going to be Linux, then you're going to have a release for Linux itself. Yeah. And for Windows, you're going to have it just it's going to be running on Windows. Yeah. And you can have actually a release that it's split between both. So you can have a job that is targeted for Windows, and then you can have a job that is targeted for Linux. And then you tell it, let's say, use this. Have to package in both sets of dependencies if they're different. Exactly. The JVM, yeah. for example. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay. Okay. Let's go actually step by step what happens whenever you get that, you give that black box, the stem cell, the YAML file that you <coughs> YAML file and that release. So the first thing it will <coughs> it will tell, it will take that YAML file and then it will say like, does do I have that state or that state in that YAML file? Does it exist? Yes or no? Let's say it doesn't exist. It's gonna have let's say one database and one web server. The first thing it's gonna do is, it's gonna contact the IAS on specifically that you're targeting, and Bosch contact the IAS using an adapter. So there's multiple adapters. There's a AWS, there's vSphere, there's GCP, there's SoftLayer, et cetera, et cetera. You have a question? Or? Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> so the first thing it will say, it will do is that it will create a VM using that, using that adapter we call CPI, Cloud Provider Interface. Whenever it creates the VM, it's gonna come up, the agent will ping home, I'm alive. And Bosch will start sending information to that agent so that it will start up. It will send, for example, it will send where to download your package from. I want to run, let's say, my jar file. Go find it in this blob store, which is another service running in the director. And it's going to also send it the actual shell scripts, for example, so that it's going to start it up. And whenever it starts the, that service, it's going to tell, I'm done. Bosch, after that, it's going to say, OK, you will always tell me in a 30 seconds interval, is the service running or not? If it's running, it's amazing. OK, I'm going to say it's alive. Else, it keeps monitoring it until it's say like either the VM doesn't go away or the actual service on the VM dies. It's going to keep monitoring it. Um, 
should be straightforward. Any questions? So is each of the, I, I don't know the terminology, but like your web yeah. servers, your, your database and what have you, does that map to a separate VM on whatever platform it happens to be? So it's going to be an EC2 instance in AWS. Um, it's going to be a VM if you're using OpenShift or whatever. Yeah. Yep, it's going to be. And so from a, from a user perspective, more or less, I don't care what's the IS you're in. From a Bosch, like, I need this service to exist somewhere. Uh, is it, B, is it uh, EC2? Is it GCP? Is it OpenStack? It's going to create it for you. From my interface, I just see there's a VM somewhere, and it's running this, 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 and this. And you can have also target multiple ISs at the same time. So I can have my half installation on AWS, and then my ha half other installation at the same time on GCP, and or third, third, and third somewhere else to have it. Any questions? No, OK. So let's go. I will not dive too much into the details, but just like what are the components of, of Bosch. So we call something first thing is the director. It's the brain that will, it will schedule processes. It's going to, if you send it a task, it's going to queue it. It's going to run it. That's the main brain. We call it the director. Uh, we have a database, for sure, to do project some state. We have workers. Those workers, they will pick up the task that you're going to run. Let's say if you're going to deploy something, or let's say seven things at, time, one, at one time, and then you have four workers going to pick up four, and then it's going to queue the third one. Uh, you have CPIs. The CPIs are the adapter that are going to talk to the IS. Uh, you have the health monitor. Health monitor is the component that will monitor is your service running and is your VM still existing? Uh, you have the message bus. That's the that's the communication between the agent sitting on the VM and the director itself the, through a message bus. Uh, we have a blob store. Whenever you upload, let's say, a release to your packages, it's going to end up in that blob store. And we have the command line interface. That's how you're interacting with the Bosch. With, with Bosch, exactly. Any questions about them? Interesting. What other features do we have? Let's say you're deploying a web application, and that application needs passwords, needs certificates, needs SSH keys, needs RSA keys, for whatever. Bosch in itself has the capability of generating those itself. You tell it, let's say, I need this certificate to be signed by whatever, with this common name, with this SAN, with whatever. It's going to create it for you. And then you're going to use it. You can use it in your software itself. So you can have some placeholders. You can Tell it that, please use me. And let's say I want to start the script with this, <coughs> this application, this service with this certificate generated on the fly. I don't care, and it's going to do for you. This is pretty cool. Why you don't need to think too much about all of these. Let's say if I have, uh, I'll show later. Let's say a Cloud Foundry installation. It has tons of certificates. Before you need to do it manually somehow. Now you can just. It's going to be a list of them. Just you can regenerate it. You can re rotate it. It don't, <coughs> you don't even care about what does it have anymore. Um, also, those credentials that you're going to send to the actual VM, let's say to the actual script to run, they will never live on the actual director VM. So from the security perspective, there's another component. It could be any component that actually implement a special interface that the director talks to. It's going to store that. Is it Vault? Is it another some some other cred store? It's going to put those credentials there after it's going to generate them, and then whenever it really use them, it will just reference, just give me the value of this and that, and then I'm going to send it to the VM. The actual director it doesn't have any any kind of credentials. Um, and there's also one cool concept: it's links. You have the web server, still as an example, and then you have the database. My web server needs to know where my database is. I don't want to hard code IPs or domain names or whatever. So you can tell it whenever you create your actual release, the job that's going to run your service, you can tell it that at runtime, I expect a link. And that link should be of type database. 
So my web server is expecting a link of type database. And that link what contains two things. It contains the special properties. Let's say if I want a, to have a username and password to connect to that database, it's going to be supplied automatically. I don't need to hard code anything. Plus, it's going to tell it where my database exists. Let's say if I have one or 100 databases cluster, it's going to give me a list of all of them. And it will be all calculated at runtime. Because I, let's say I deploy on AWS with this specific subnet cider, with whatever, it's going to be that the <coughs> those IPs will be different than another subnet. So it will be calculated automatically on the fly. You change the subnet, it doesn't care. It's going to just recalculate everything and send those IPs to whatever needs them. And this is a pretty cool concept to not hard code IPs, which used to happen. Any questions? Are those link types like database, is that something you define yourself as the deployer, or are those inherent to Bosch? Uh, as a deploy, uh, this one, whenever you create your release, you will define them. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so whenever you create a release, you can define any type you want, and then you expect that Bosch somehow, whenever you create, whenever you run that job, yeah. it's going to satisfy it. And how does it satisfy it? There's another job that's provide that link, and then it's going to give it to it. To have it. So, a little bit in the case where I'm using load balancing, for example. So, I'm using AWS as a load balancer. Yep. For I, I will not do half a million because I'm cheap. <laughs> uh, I'll do less than that. Okay. <coughs> Is it good enough? Okay. So, We have a Bosch environment. It's running on AWS. <coughs> okay. So <coughs> this VM, we call it Bosch. <coughs> I already deployed it. And it, it's running the actual software. And I can contact it. It's on this IP. And all is running well. So let's say I want to see what kind of releases. So if you remember, we will need to feed it three things. We'll feed it the OS image, we'll feed it the actual software that we want to run, and we'll feed it a YAML file, what to do with our stuff. So I, went, <coughs> I already uploaded few, one release. I call it JMeter, the one that I just uh, uh, extracted before. Just <coughs> and if we do, let's say here stem cells. So <clears throat> remember that stem cell is, think about it as an IS specific wrapper of an OS image. Let's say on AWS is gonna be an AMI, on GCP it's gonna be whatever GCP has a wrapper. For here, because it's AWS, so we have uh, two AMIs with two different versions. And I have two different versions for one reason I'll, I'm gonna show later. So we have the release and then we have the stem cells. What we're missing is the YAML file. OK. So uh, before I'm going to show the YAML file, I'm going to show one thing here. OK. <clears throat> so this is a sample of what's going to happen right now. We have the Bosch director in green. We have the CLI. We're just running it locally. We're going to give it a command. Please create me specific X number of VMs. And in that X number of VMs, just I want to target specific things. I want to run JMeter with specific configuration. And till now, let's see actually what kind of YAML file do we have here. OK. Have anybody used JMeter in distributed mode? So just a recap, so <coughs> JMeter has two modes, one which is <coughs> standalone, one node. You just run it and then that server, <coughs> that let's say, uh, that standalone service is going to target something. And then it has a distributed mode where you run X number of JMeter instances as servers or workers. And then you run, let's say, 10, 20, 100. And then you run another JMeter server, but you call it as a client, if I remember. 
and then the client, you need to give it all the IP addresses of the other workers, and then it's gonna distribute the actual plan, the GMX plan, to those 100, let's say, VMs, 100 instances, not even VMs, of JMeter, and then it's gonna run in parallel. Those will execute, they will report back the result to the actual client, and then you have your result. This we're gonna automate in this one. So, I have a deployment. A deployment, it's a, a set of services I'm gonna have. I'm gonna call it JMeter. It has this kind, it has one release. I'm gonna use this stem cell. Uh, let's not worry about those. Actually, let's worry about them. Uh, let's say you have, <coughs> you can have how many canaries you wanna have. Let's say if I'm doing an update, how many VMs or services I'm gonna update at, at, po at a certain point of time, let's say one, two, 10. I have five here and I have instance group. Think about instance groups as services that's gonna run. The first one is the workers. So those are the JMeter workers that's gonna happen. And I'm gonna have, let's say, five. So I have five JMeter workers. And remember that this one will run the JV, JMeter as a, <coughs> as a worker mode. And then let's say I give it here JVM options. You can give it whatever options that you want, that you have uh, already implemented. Let's say I want to run it because it's small VM with this uh, XMS and XMMX. And what VM type I want to have, it's going to be a small one, and which stem cell and which network. I'm going to skip the talk, uh, talk about those for a bit. And then we have this guy. The second one is the client that it's going to run, and then it's going to communicate with all the VMs. It's going to report to all of them get the result back and report it. So that's outside of the group. Exactly. exactly. Uh, uh, outside the instance group. Have, each instance is going to have five, five star worker groups? Uh, each instance, uh, sorry, we have five instances and each instance will have one JMeter instance on it. Okay. Yeah, this one. And the other instance, uh, there's another type of instance which we're going to call Storm. It's going to have one instance and it's going to communicate with all of them to report back the result. And here, for example, this is because we're going to, this one is going to report all, it's going to tell it like which target I'm going to just, let's say, load test. <coughs> just this is my own configuration. Let's say how many users I'm going to make it, let's say, I know, 10 for now. Uh, I want to ramp up time that and then let's make it, let's make it 60 seconds for, or 120. Who cares? Let's run for two minutes for now. And how many delays, let's say I have, I don't know, one second delay between each request. And you can have a list of targets. I have just a uh, HTML file sitting in a S3 bucket. And uh, you can have a post, get, put, all that configuration. So let's get working. So, so I have that guy here. So I'm gonna tell it Okay, so remember that you didn't see any IP addresses now. We don't even care. We didn't, so let's see. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna deploy. This is my deployment. And then I'm gonna deploy, what I'm gonna deploy? This JMeter. It's gonna tell me, do you wanna do it? Yep. And let's see what's gonna happen here. In a bit, we will see. Those instances. So while they're running. Let's go through this one too. So <coughs> it's going to create it on a network, some network, let's say on a subnet somewhere. So those subnets, Bosch will not define it for you. You need to define it yourself, and then you need to tell the definition of that subnet to Bosch itself. So for example, let's go to, as example, Bosch deployment. This is another type of YAML file that you need to provide it. You tell it, for example, it's an IaaS specific one. Let's say <coughs> I have a VM type which is large, but for this IaaS mean it's an M4X large. And I have, let's say, a disk type, and I need this 
this disk size. I don't care how do you create it, just do it, create it for me. And this is the network, which is interesting. Uh, let's say I have this subnet with this range, with this gateway, with this specific ID, which is the subnet ID for this IaaS. And whenever you tell I want to create this service, this service on this subnet, it's going to go pick a, an IP and then it's going to assign it. You define it once, and then all your services are, all your services are going to just create it from it. So let's see where those are coming. OK. Any questions so far? Anything? You will create for specific, uh, it's the same structure, but for example, let's say subnet ID doesn't exist for GCP, it exists for AWS. So you have a special section that what, whatever IaaS you're targeting, uh, you will need to put the properties for that IaaS there. <coughs> so let's see if it's if done. Yep, let's do it actually. So it's gonna do, uh, the f it's the first thing that you did. Let's say I want six here, and then so it's finished. I go and then I deploy it, and then it tell me only one one has changed. Well, yes, let's wait for it. Yeah, <coughs> you're gonna cost me one more VM. <laughs> <laughs> What, uh, what, what happens if you turn it up to a million? <laughs> uh, do you have the money? Do you have the money for it? Hang on, makes a lot of money. Hang on. <laughs> having, having tried this, so I did something similar with Ansible about three years ago uh, with 150 machines in the cluster. What happens is we all go have several beers because it'll take Amazon a really long time to give you more than about 20, when, when you pass about 20, 30 instances that the rate at which you get instances from Amazon slows down. You need, you need actually to request it. Because yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but. Yeah, so I, I recently did a uh, 150 VM cluster. Oh, yeah? Uh, on GCP. Yeah. It took about, like, maybe like 30 minutes to make. Well, that's not bad. So it's when I was doing, when I was, uh, when I was doing it three years ago, it was like, you'd start it up, yeah. and I would go have lunch. You need to use Bosch, that's why. <laughs> So you need to work. It was just Amazon. Would, you would wait for instances to be available at the time. And so Bosch is a is a torture task for an IS. <laughs> that it has discovered many a bug in different ISs. So. Okay. And think about it now. Let's say we didn't even care about how Jmeter works. It's whoever created that release already took care of it. I don't care. Like, what do you run? How do you run it? Just I want this configuration. I want to target this. <coughs> This URL, that how many times with that many users, just do it for me. So whenever this, is, okay. So this is done. If you go Bosch instances, so you can see you can have one, two, three, four, five, six, six instances, and then there's the seventh one. This is <coughs> so those are workers. They are just listening on a port. That service doing nothing. And now I'm going to tell it just please run it. So it's going to create this VM, it's going to distribute the load to all of these, and then it's going to wait for them to finish and then report back. So I'm going to run. I'm going to keep it alive for now. And I want to download the logs. OK. Cool. So <clears throat> what is this command exactly? What does it mean, run errand, which I didn't cover? This is a service that is long running. It's going to just stay running until you really shut it down. In Bosch, there's another terminology, which is an errand. It's a short-lived task. I want to run a smoke test. Everything is good, destroy the VM and go away. So what I'm doing here is <coughs> that JMeter client that's going to run, it's going to run in a VM, is going to report just 
is going to do its task, wait for it to finish, and then it's going to report back, and then it's going to delete it. But I said just for the sake of this, keep it alive for now because I want to reuse it. But if I say didn't, don't keep alive, it's going to report back the result and then just destroy itself to have it. So it's still creating the VM. Any questions? Interesting. So, sorry, just, just to clarify, this this errand that you're running, this is the actual. It is taking the the the, the tarball or whatever you created, and it's deploying it to all the servers and having to run. Is that, is that what's happening there? Uh, not really. So, whenever we did the deploy at the first place, that already happened then. Okay. Running an errand is basically you're running a script on a VM. That's it. And that script, it's already you already uploaded it before to Bosch, and then Bosch is going to push it to the VM, it's going to run it. To the, the coordinator VM? Or to, all the to the coordinator VM. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want, for example, to push it to all of them, you can just need to deploy it more time, and then it depends on your specific situation. Yeah. So you can see now it created the instance, it updated it, and then it's going to run it. It's going to take two minutes to finish. And actually, it's, uh, it can handle it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it can handle it. Like whenever the half million users pinging it, eh. <laughs> like I paid money for it, but <laughs> they don't care. Did so you fill out the uh, AWS penetration testing request before you did this? Yeah. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I, I'm pay if, if I'm paying for something, I don't care. Oh, no. <laughs> right? If I'm paying for it, right? <laughs> um, Is this recorded? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, what happened, can you have um, a, a service that is in charge of managing the deployments through Bosch of other services? You can, yeah, you can have that. Yeah, yeah. let's say one server that is like talking to Bosch to main, like to deploy something. Yeah, yeah you that can was have. itself deployed through Bosch. Oh yeah, you can totally. Yeah, yeah it's, it's exactly what <coughs> the open service brokers do. Uh, if you go to Open Source Broker API, a lot of the ones we do will actually run a Bosch deployment to create for you like a Kubernetes cluster or a MySQL cluster or anything that Bosch deployment. Okay, so it's, it's quite common actually. So this is what I did. Like the on-demand service broker will say if you create, <coughs> let's say in Cloud Foundry, I want to create a Java app and then I want to create, I want to uh, attach a database service to it, and I don't want to have like already running cluster of databases. I just want to just create the database for me now and shut it down whenever I want to do it. So you <coughs> it will inform Bosch, just deploy specific things. It's going to run that service, right. and then it's going to get the credentials, whatever you need for your service, and then it's going to so run. So are there like client libraries for Bosch for, let's say, Java, or like aside from just the command line? Or the uh, it's through an API. Okay. It's through an API. Like, like a REST API? It's a REST API, yeah. A REST, probably. Resting. Rest is a big word, yeah. <laughs> okay. JSON over HTTP. That's uh, a safe way to say, say rest. Exactly. Who, who does the rest, right? Okay. So we can see <coughs> it has finished and it has downloaded some tarball because I tell it to download it. So let's go here. Boom, 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 boom. Deployments. This guy. Okay. That's the tarball it downloaded. Not that guy. Okay. So this is some logs. This is the GTL. That's like the result of JMeter. Sure, it's just a bunch of files, but in JMeter you can generate a visual report whenever you have it. So for example, it will tell us that it has requested 3,819 times this URL. There was no failures. It's S3. There's some charts, response time, latency over time, something. If we had it over many minutes or like hours, it's going to be it's going to be more different. Uh, hits per second, latency. Yeah, it's basically this is the built-in JMeter reporter. 
So whatever JMeter will give you is going to just download it for you. Uh, more or less, this is it. Now let's say I'm done. I want to run something else. It's going to just run it. Uh, if I want, like, I'm done with this deployment, go bosh, dash D, JMeter, delete, dash, deployment. Yes. It's going to delete all the instances. They should say they are shutting down sometime. If it is. Yep. So the nice thing about this is that, let's say, <coughs> you can have it on GCP, you can have it, let's say, it's cheaper if you want to load test something. You can have it on, if you have, I don't know, a V block with some vSphere, just put it there. Uh, <coughs> you put that configuration file, it's going to create the VM, it's going to load test it. And if you want to have on-demand service broker for this, let's say if I want to load my test application, I don't want to just go to a third-party service to do that. I just like tell it, please create me five instances. I want to, let's say, <coughs> you can make this interface much better. You can have a UI behind it. And I just, I want that X amount of users to be created and then to stress test it. It's going to give you the result and it's totally IaaS agnostic. It doesn't care to have it. So, um, so there's a few products out on the market that do similar sorts of things. Uh, yep, there is. Terraform uh, and HashiCorp, I think, is the one that are off. Terraform is the the HashiCorp. <coughs> Terraform is HashiCorp. Yes. Yeah, and then it's like, yeah, it's few. So how does how does this compare? Like, what's Okay. What do you feel like this has that they don't know? Okay, let's say whenever you want to use Terraform and then whenever you want to deploy something, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> do you package your software somehow? Sure. Is it, <coughs> and let's say, <coughs> and then it's going to take it and then it's going to dump it on that VM, right? If you, does it monitor it? Fair. It doesn't monitor it, right? I can't speak about too much Terraform because I use it only. I use it only like to set up the infrastructure. Sure. I feel Bosch. It's a bit above layer of Terraform. Okay. So let's say uh, you use. We use Terraform to create the infrastructure. When I say the infrastructure, let's say mostly the networks. Just like I want to find this subnet with this security group with this whatever, and then let Bosch just handle it, and then you tell it I want to use this infrastructure to create it. Where? To have it. Here's a, here's a good way to think about Terraform. Terraform is a process. You run it once and it stops. Okay. Bosch is a server. It's continuously monitoring. So the best way to think of Bosch, if you want to use academic terms, think of it as a narrow artificial intelligence. You tell it the desired state of the world. It's constantly comparing the desired state of the world against the actual state that the IaaS has, and it converges it. I.e., it's a freaking thermostat for your services. <laughs> you tell it what you want, and it makes sure that the world looks like what you want. So that's the primary difference between Terraform and Bosch. So, so if you were to shut down a one of the workers, like just manually, yeah, uh, Bosch would. It will re <coughs> it will recreate it. Yeah. It will recreate it with the same state. Everything. So, like one of the most kind of cool demos uh, we do with Cloud Foundry is you set up an instance of Cloud Foundry and then you go in and you like destroy a server. Like I've had, I've had situations where like the operations people like nearly freaked out because we were upgrading the server, the developers were using it, and the guy turns around to his guys and says, "Is this smoke and mirrors? Is this actually happening? Am I seeing VMs die and everything?" They're like, "Yeah, we're using it. It's working." So you can actually use this technology to set up some really high availability systems, um, uh, there's, there's a lot to work. OK, so high availability, you say. But I, I don't see one uh, Bosch node there right now. So how, how does that uh, work? Um, so you're saying there's a cluster? So you could actually set up a distributed Bosch if you wanted to. Then you would need a single node Bosch to set up a multi node Bosch. <laughs> No, no, this is, uh -uh. no, no, you can have, well, it's, the interesting, the interesting part is that, let's say, if I have a hundred database cluster, right, I wouldn't actually use, for example, if I want to do it with Bosch right now, I'll have two Bosches, 
and both of them are just deploying, let's say, 50-50. And if Bosch goes down, actually, your services are still running. I don't care. They still run. Like, they're not really, they, you don't really need Bosch to run it. If one goes down, just like who cares, right? Just recreate it. And you, we usually actually deploy Bosch on top of another Bosch. But it sounds like you also do service discovery through Bosch, right? Like some like console, right? So how, how do you do like that, right? Service discovery? Yeah. We have internal DNS. So if you remember links, so let's say I want to have a, um, a database, and then I have a server, right? And then I want my server to know where my database is. Fur. Before, it, before links, you need to tell it just the IP hard-coded. With links, <coughs> rather than give it, giving it the IP, let's say whenever I consume a link from a database, it doesn't really give me the IP. It gives me a specific DNS record name. It's going to be mydb.whatever.whatever.bosh. And internally, we have a DNS server that on your machine, my web server, whenever I communicate with that DNS, with that domain name, is going to resolve internally to the IP of that database or to the IP, it's going to, let's say, their smart DNS, which is being work right, worked on right now, that, for example, is going to do a round robin. Every time I ping it, it's going to give me one IP. I don't care. You can set it up any way you want to have it. That's, well, uh, wouldn't that IP be tied to a particular wash node? So. And not really, no. no. It's going to be tied to a particular VM. For example, let's say I have 100 database cluster, and each one, will, one of them will have, let's say, a DNS record name, and I have another DNS record name that is round robin among all of them. I just like wget1, and then it's or like ping it or whatever. Basically, your Bosch node only needs to be up when, when something happens. Yeah. So you, your Bosch node needs to be up when something goes down to fix it, but if Ex it's down and everything else is working, that's okay. Whenever we update Bosch, actually it's down, right? But uh, like the service, the DNS is still working because the DNS actually, we have a DNS component on each VM that's being pushed to. So like if Bosch goes down, who cares? The <coughs> especially like there's no, new, there's no new services that you are creating. So the DNS record names are going to resolve to the same IPs so to have it. Work existing services into Bosch. So if my Bosch node dies and I want to bring the Bosch node back up and get whatever was running, was being managed, Back in, yep, there's something called, it's like we call it backup and restore. You get backup, and let's say I just go and then delete the whole VM with its, with its persistent disk. You can just, with that command, it's going to create the same, the same node again, like a different node, but similar, with the same components, and it's going to know the same IP, which the same DNS records, and then it's going to just come up, yeah. So one of the things to remember is Bosch is never on the request processing path for anything you're doing. So Bosch is like usually set up on a network that's not accessible to users. It's only for people managing. So if I want a high availability database, I would I would tell Bosch to install a node on each availability zone. Yep. And then if Bosch is down, who cares? Like restore it reasonably quickly, i.e. in half an hour or less. If one of your database nodes goes down, if you have a multi-AZ setup, your database keeps going. Or you can have a multi-region, or you can have a multi-IS. I can have my <coughs> half databases on GCP, not a third on GCP, third on Azure, third on Amazon. And... It's only two-thirds of work that you're doing. Yep. <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> Yep. Sorry, I'm poking fun at Azure, not you guys. Oh, no. <laughs> We're only a gateway for IaaS, yeah. So, <clears throat> and that's only one Bosch instance. It's going to talk to all of them. And then it's going to just tell it I want to create. And there's also a, uh, if, you <clears throat> if you like Windows, Windows mesh stem cells. And then it's going to create to have. Any questions? Interesting. Go ahead. So in the day two situation where you want to update the version of JMeter, so we have a Bosch release for the new version of JMeter, yeah. is it Bosch that knows how to do the canary stuff, or do you have to go that into your Bosch release of JMeter? Uh, where, where, where's that logic live? OK, let's do it, actually. Let's do it. Do we have time, actually? I don't know. <coughs> let's do it. Eight minutes. Eight minutes? OK. Come on, AWS. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. 
and please the Wi-Fi help me. <coughs> uh, let's say I have the latest version of JMeter right now, right? And this is the latest. Let me, I want to use the, uh, the old one. Although I'm not sure the configuration. The configuration should work probably. <coughs> I'm going to just go download it. So let's say we were using this JMeter re release. So I'm gonna just lay, I'm gonna use just the one be below it. So I'm gonna tell it go Bosch. Actually, it's gonna be called Bosch, but I'm gonna upload dash release. I'm gonna upload this one. It's gonna do. <coughs> it's gonna take some time just to hopefully not too much. And um, so whenever that version, you just actually switch the version inside your manifest, the YAML file. And if, <clears throat> let's say maybe the, okay, it's done. So I don't want to use the latest. I want to use 2.0.10. Was it this one? Yep. So if I do go bash releases. Yep, it was, you got it. So I'm going to use the previous version. So I just uploaded it and then I changed the version there. And I hope that, yeah, it should be working here. And I want just to make it easy for now. Let me make only one instance. Go bash dash the geometer to play geometer.yaml. So I have one instance and then it has the whatever version of the release somewhere. This guy, 2.1, yes, is going to just create it for me. But was your question about redeploying with a different version, or was there's an active version and you want to redeploy and have everything move to the new version? Those so are like two yeah. different things. Yeah, okay. So the can canary style deployments, Bosch handles, or do you have to worry about that? Sorry, the canary? Like a canary style deployment where I'm going to say, okay, I've got 20 of these things. Yeah. I'm going to take five and then deploy the new version, make yep. sure it works. Yep, you can. Shift traffic or whatever. Yep, you can. Basically, you have like in the canary section here. For example, let's say <coughs> I want to have, let's say, only one canary. So <coughs> it's going to work differently than what, you, what you're saying, but, but you can do another s setup that you can do it the same way you're doing. For example, let's say <coughs> I have one canary, right? Something like this. And if I'm doing a, let's say I updated a version of the release and then I hit deploy, and if that canary, let's say it didn't report healthiness, it's gonna stop. Okay. If it's report healthiness, then it's gonna just continue. But let's say, <coughs> let's say I've, I have, let's say 20 database nodes, right? And then I wanna just update those five for now. And then I wanna just leave the 15. What you can do is just like this instance group, just copy paste it. It's gonna be another instance group. So you will need to treat it as another instance group. Okay. And you can, <coughs> it's gonna be the same configuration, but like you're gonna <laughs> technically use the five as your canaries. You can update, update the release, and then your 15 is gonna be the same. Hopefully they are compatible. Yeah, but of course, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not your problem or anything. Like exactly. Like exactly. <coughs> it's up to whoever created the release to have it. Yeah. So now let's say <coughs> let's say I want to switch the version inside. Like currently, let's say if <coughs> I have the oldest version. So if I have here, go bash releases, it's gonna tell me it's using this version. I want to use the new one. Let's say it's an example. I just go here and let's say two one. It's not gonna destroy the VM because it's gonna only update the software. It's going to tell me only <coughs> you made the canaries, but one, and then I update the version, and then it's going to deploy it for you. So you it was good. The healthy. Yeah. Can I define healthy? Uh, you or can. Is it just a question of is the thing running? Like, can I, can I have some set of criteria I provide somehow that says this is healthy 
for whatever definition I go to. Okay, so <clears throat> from a Bosch perspective, there's two kinds of healthiness. Okay. Is the VM there? If the VM is not there, you're not healthy. Or, sure. fair enough, and if, is the process running is healthy? Let's say there's a pit file, it's going to monitor. But let's say, is there is the load on this process is higher than whatever, it's not going to do that. That would be like another monitoring software sure. that you're going to have. Oh, that's fair. Yep. Okay. So what, is it one process per, per thing? Or you can have X number of processes on your VM. If the process hangs or there's some kind of exception, that's not as well. Bosch has monitored that process right there. Or restart the process. It's going to, if, 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 if a process hangs, yeah. it's going to monitor that. If there's a pit file, it's going to monitor it. And then let's say if if it uh, hangs, do you know that there's a tool called Monit? Yeah, that's what it uses. Okay. We can yeah. Monit. Monit, and we're going actually to replace it to have the fine the grained one. So there's a process. So so if you suspect something is unhealthy, the easiest thing to do in the Bosch world is go kill the VM. So so effectively, I have my external monitoring system and. Its reaction to failure is go kill that thing, and don't worry because it'll come back up. Basically, it's presumably you need to have some kind of monitoring. It's fine. You could, you could package a monitor with your VM. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. Would, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to come across as like a. No, no. I'm just saying. Right. We're used to it. That's We're fair. used to like, it. I don't know. It's fair, to, it's fair to say that that's somebody else's problem. Basically. Yeah. So the, there is a stream of metrics you can tap into that tells you things like what is the state of all the VMs, how much CPU are they using, other stuff. There's also a thing called Bosch add-ons, where you can say, well, Bosch, whenever you set up a VM for me, please drop the following extra pieces of software on. So you could drop like antivirus scanners, other agents, monitoring agents, uh, in, in very low-level ways. So like Bosch is all about virtual machines. It's not about containers. It's about the stuff below the containers. Yep. This is what Eddie was talking about. So I guess like one of the biggest installation of Bosch is Bluemix. I don't have a clear number of VMs, uh, which is, in <coughs> they are also contributors, less than Pivotal. Uh, Pivotal also uses it, like it's in production. Um, hundreds of VMs, I can't say the number, even more. Yeah, you can get to thousands of VMs. Yep. Like the, the reality is the reason why people use this is uh, you end up in situations where you got one or two people part time that can manage the clusters of hundreds, high hundreds of VMs. So, um, like, uh, an, like an anecdote I've heard is that, like, the people who created Bosch were also worked, part, worked for Google in the past, and Google had an internal system called Borg. So, when it was time to name their project, they did Borg plus plus. That's the name Bosch. <laughs> so. Yep. <laughs> And maybe one last thing to show. That's terrible. <laughs> I like I like I like the name. I like the name. That's terrible. Okay. <clears throat> so surprise me, but it's terrible. <laughs> so remember now we have uh, we have one VM, I think. Yep, somewhere. So we have one VM running a specific version of the OS image. Let's say there's a kernel update, and then I want to run a new one. Let's say <coughs> now I'm shifting down, but imagine it's up. So what I do, I just go and then tell it, please use this one, right? OK. Just tell it, just to recreate the same. So what I'm going to do is, <coughs> it's going to tell me, stem cells, you have created a new one, which is 3554, yes. It's now compiling the packages because it's a new version. Uh, we're going to wait, but it's going to just replace that OS image, that VM with the new OS image. This is why it actually does the compilation. Because if I change my OS, I could have different versions of the, the statically linked libraries. <coughs> so by being able to compile packages on the stem cell, I know that the code will work. Yep. Sometimes of an SSL. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Partly. Somewhat optional upgrades. That you yep. Do. <laughs> so currently. <But> open us <coughs> to weird things. Never. <laughs> it's recreating it, the same VM 
with the same software on it from another software, let's say you have a kernel update, just one command and you're gonna. So, so basically like part of what Pivotal is doing with Cloud Foundry is that we're getting to the point where we can rotate all the VMs on a continuous basis. So every like, let's say hour or two, all the VMs get rebuilt. That way if somebody broke into a VM, they only got a couple of hours to do something bad before you're rebuilding the VM from a, from a golden image. It's already happened. Yeah, that's already happened. And then because the Bosch is storing the credentials in the Craig Hub, you could also rotate all the certificates and all the passwords for everything in the system. And if there's a patch, you saw how easy it is to, to upgrade it. So like I said, Bosch is, a, is like a thermostat for your VMs and services. You just tell it what you want and it'll go and do it. Yeah, cool, okay. So until it compile, Anyone have questions? Cool. Thank you very much.